Hello, my name is Asim Hussain. I am the Chief Marketing Officer at QuantumScape, and today I'm joined by our co-founder and Chief Technology Officer, Tim Holm. Today we're going to do a general update with our CTO and talk a little bit about the history of the company as well as our latest technical updates and how they fit into our current product roadmap. Also, specifically where we stand in terms of some of our manufacturing capabilities development on our path toward commercialization. Before we get started, as a public company, I'm obliged to tell you that any type of forward-looking statements such as projections of our technology performance are subject to risks described in our SEC filings. So with that, Tim, it's been a while since we, had, we talked to you, and I actually wanted to take a step back first. Um, the company was founded by yourself, Jagdeep, and Professor Fritz Prince at Stanford. So I wanted to first just uh, start with what was the initial research at Stanford that, uh, in terms of the work that you guys were doing that led to the founding of QuantumScape? In the Prince lab, we were looking at various energy storage and conversion devices. We did some research on fuel cells, solar cells, and batteries. And we were looking at a particular solid state technology that looked very interesting from a standpoint of energy storage. So we applied for a grant from ARPA-E, which was the just established branch of the Department of Energy that was uh, established to fund high risk, high reward projects in energy. And once we won that award, we had the funding to continue our research, but it also kind of put us on the map for some local venture capitalists who were calling us and encouraging us to start a company it never seemed realistic at that stage until I met Jagdeep Singh with his background of successfully founding companies. At that point, it seemed realistic that we could then start a company. I wouldn't have to learn how to manage a company. I could stick to the science. So we got a little bit of funding. We left the RPE project at Stanford, and we set out on our own mission to try and um, take what I thought was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to make an impact in the field of energy storage. And as, as you're working through that process of getting started, what were those early days like in terms of setting up the research to actually you know, build a next generation battery? Yeah, we were uh, scrappy or resourceful, I guess you could say. We took that initial bit of funding and went out and the first thing we did was try and recruit a, a strong core team. So we got a few people um, who I knew, who Jagdeep knew, who were in our network, in the VC network. and had a very strong team. We had, went out looking for equipment and went to eBay and kind of looked for a bunch of secondhand equipment, characterization equipment like battery cyclers, SEM, XPS, as well as some fabrication equipment and glove boxes. We set all that up in a lab. We set up some computational abilities to do comp computational material screening. We also set up a database and some software infrastructure to capture all the data that we were generating because we knew that we wanted a centralized source of truth that would allow us to do statistics. Uh, it was a little bit early for machine learning then, but to do a, a robust, rigorous data analysis. All of that research and testing, was it focused on the separator, you know, in the battery, or how were you guys thinking about the battery as a whole, just so folks can understand what you guys were actually testing? Yeah, so we had, uh, Jagdeep set out three key metrics for us um, to take a radical improvement. That was watt hours per liter, the amount of energy that a battery can store per volume, watt hours per kilogram, the amount of energy the battery can store per mass, and cost, dollars per kilowatt hour. He wanted us to make a big enough impact on those three metrics that we would have a large advantage over lithium ion because we knew that lithium ion wouldn't stand still, it would improve over time, so we had to be sufficiently differentiated. So we set off with that target and then set, evaluated a number of different technologies that would allow us to potentially meet that target. We were looking at some things that we had done research on at Stanford using nanoscales or quantum effects, using solid state techniques. Um, pretty quickly we settled on a lithium metal anode as the differentiator that could make the single biggest improvement over lithium ion batteries. We all, we're also looking to, then to apply our nanostructuring to cathode materials. And we ended up generating some pretty interesting results, but then saying, okay, a lithium metal anode is both a big enough impact and a hard enough problem to solve. Let's tackle that first 
and then consider other things as the second generation. So Tim, fast forwarding to today, and uh, in terms of the goals that we have for 2023, we set out some ambitious goals, and those all connect to our roadmap for the QSE5, our first announced commercial product. How do those goals you know, progress us towards the delivery of that initial product? Yeah, so we've had a really exciting last six or nine months. We, uh, at the end of last year, delivered our first automotive A samples to customers. And then we've been building on that by increasing the energy density of our cells. So a lot of the goals that we've laid out for ourselves this year have been in terms of translating that first automotive A sample into a real product, that QSE5, that we intend to be our first launch product. So announcing that and, and a partner to go to market with has been really, really um, exciting. We've had to take several steps. One is turn from a power cell into an energy cell architecture. So we've increased the cathode mass loading that allows us to fit more energy into the cell. And then the next step for us is to improve the packaging efficiency of the cell. So we narrow down the, some of the manufacturing tolerances um, and, and thin down some of the inactive components. That also allows us to increase the energy density of a cell, which to a driver of a car will translate to longer range, lower cost. Mm -hmm. I just want to uh, ask though, when you talk about a power cell versus an energy cell, does that mean that that thicker cathode is now going to have a slower charge time? I mean, how, how would that compare? Yeah, good point. Lithium ion batteries can make a certain trade-off along a frontier, a Pareto optimal frontier of energy and power. Mm -hmm. You can make the, the electrodes thicker and denser with less porosity. That will give the electrode more energy and less power. Um, our cathode will have a similar trade-off where we can make it uh, denser and more highly loaded for more energy with less power, but the f that frontier should be pushed out relative to where lithium ion is. So any operating point on the frontier of that technology should be dominant relative to the, the lithium ion. That's, that's our intention, that's our goal. Mm -hmm. So that what that means is holding energy constant, you can get faster charge, or holding charge rate constant, you can get higher energy. Coming back to the QSC5 then, uh, what would be the intent um, as you're looking at those trade-offs? Would we still be able to do, for example, a, a 15 minute uh, level type of charge? Yeah, we're targeting a 15 minute from 10 to 80% charge at higher energy density than you can get in today's lithium ion batteries. Okay, great. And then, you know, I think going back to today's lithium ion batteries, as we think about that performance frontier, um, how would you compare sort of where some of, some of the trade-offs that pe people are making with traditional lithium ion compared to kind of what we're doing? Yeah, well, the, a car designer or a cell designer can choose somewhere to sit on this power versus energy frontier. They could uh, select, say, a, a faster charge rate, like 18 minutes in some cases, uh, at a lower energy density, which translates eventually to higher costs uh, and shorter range of a car. Or some automakers and battery designers are opting for a very energy dense design. Um, which then compromises on charge rate. So you'll see more like 40 minute charge rate mm -hmm. from 10 to 80%. Beyond charge time and energy density, what, are, what do you see as some of the other key benefits of the QSC5? Yeah, um, the, the key, some of the key metrics for batteries would be cycle life. So because we've eliminated the anode and therefore the anode SEI, solid electrolyte interface, that is one of the main, main sources of capacity fade. We think we can get competitive or better cycle life than uh, today's uh, energy cells can. Um, and the cycle life being sort of the lifetime of the battery? Exactly. Okay. How many charge and discharge cycles the battery gets as it degrades. So all batteries will degrade at, at some rate. Uh, as owners of cell phones will notice that their phone probably doesn't last as long now as when they bought it. Um, the batteries degrade over time. And one of the major sources of degradation in today's batteries is that SEI that I mentioned. On so the that, anode side. On the anode side. Mm -hmm. So if you look at our cycling curves that we've published, you'll see substantial energy retention up to 800 cycles. 
800 cycles is the targets that we and our automotive partners have set for an energy cell like ours because if you have say a 300 mile range car times 800 mile 800 cycles that would give you 240,000 miles of range on the car mm -hmm. you you asked about other metrics cost is really a key metric now that electric vehicles are starting to have substantial penetration of the vehicle market a lot of the car makers are looking at driving down costs you know one of the three key metrics we had from the beginning was cost and so we're really looking at minimizing the cost of our cell we believe that by eliminating the anode we're eliminating a whole set of materials and the deposition processes that are used to create that anode in a mm -hmm. battery factory if you walk into a, a battery factory some of the major lines that you'll see are a cathode coating line and an anode coating line. In our factory, we wouldn't have that anode coating line. So that should right. translate to lower cost, we, we hope, in, in the fullness of scale. And lower carbon in the battery, right, given that there's no graphite? That's right. So um, a naturally occurring graphite is mined and has less emissions, but what you need for a high-performance battery is an artificial graphite that's created by essentially pyrolyzing a carbon source like an organic material. That pyrolyzation process is done at thousands of degrees C, which then has a lot of embodied emissions. So a large fraction of the emissions created in, in making a lithium ion battery are actually due to the anode. So by eliminating that, we're hoping to have a greener process. And then you haven't mentioned safety. Um, how do we think about that as we think about um, solid state? products from quantum scale. Yeah, for a long time our thesis has been that a solid state battery should be a, a safer battery. We're eliminating some of the flammable and combustible elements in a lithium ion battery by removing some of that organic mat materials from it. We're also then putting in a, a solid ceramic material between the anode and cathode. One of the real innovations in lithium ion batteries over the last few years has been to include some ceramic materials in the electrolyte so that in the event of, of some safety situation, if the polymer melts, there's still some ceramic keeping a separation between anode and cathode. Of course, our separator is a fully ceramic material, fully mm -hmm. dense. So it should serve that purpose to an even greater degree. This isn't just about the uh, evolution of the technology in terms of defining what the battery technology looks like. The other aspect is really scaling up and uh, it comes back to manufacturing processes too for this separator that we've developed and you know as the CTO you've been leading up one of the most critical elements of that by developing the high-speed uh, heat treatment processes for that separator production process that we colloquially call Raptor and Cobra so how about we talk a little bit about how did that process start and how is that development going great we realized, um, as we've mentioned previously, that cost is one of the key metrics of the battery. So every component going into it has to be cost optimized. The separator is the main differentiating component of our batteries relative to lithium ion in terms of what needs to be fabricated. So we knew that our separator has to be roughly cost competitive with today's separators that are already produced at scale. So we went back and did a lot of fundamental research, which um, I, I think is, is extremely interesting, at how can we make our separators with high throughput and higher, higher throughput and higher quality. So we set out the, the goal for ourselves, reduce the operating expenses in making a separator, reduce the capital expenses, make everything more efficient. So it should be less labor, less footprint in a lab, less electricity consumed, uh, er, less throwaway materials. And through the, the results of our teams, very talented, dedicated teams working on the process, we were able to take, it, take just a concept and demonstrate that it could actually work. And not only could we make the separator in a faster production process, but we could also then prove that it worked electrochemically. Uh, this is basically the de design for manufacturability approach that we've taken to reinvent the separator production process. So we're essentially taking, making a, a ceramic separator at high speed in a continuous process, that's the goal. Um, how would you compare that to, you know, 
existing ceramic processes? Are we able to utilize some existing equipment versus having to create new equipment? And then how did that all come together in Raptor? So the reason that we're taking two steps in this evolutionary process is once we realized that we could do this more rapid separator production process, we said, all right, what's the quickest way that we can adopt this technology and start using it not only to, to prove out that it works, but get more, more practice using it. Um, the quickest way we could adopt it was to take existing equipment that we had already purchased um, and basically retrofit it to run through the FAST process. So that's what we're calling the Raptor process. It's a retrofit of equipment that we already had on order to run in a faster scheme. And then in the COBRA process, it's something that we've basically taken a, a from the ground up redesign approach to. We have a team of designers, in-house engineers, working with process teams to design that equipment. Right, and then, you know, I think the, just to reiterate some of the timeline for this, we've talked about how a lot of the Raptor equipment is uh, deployed. How do you see sort of the progression of the Raptor equipment versus the Cobra equipment, and what does that imply for some of the samples that we actually have to deliver to customers? Yeah, well, our timelines are, um, we have installed the Raptor equipment. We're now working really on, on schedule as planned to qualify the process running on Raptor. So we expect next year in 2024 to be using Raptor to, to make the samples that we'll be sending out for our customer sampling. Uh, in the meantime, we are, we'll be placing orders for the Cobra equipment. Uh, so we're expecting that in the 2025 and 2026 timeframe, we'll be running production on the Cobra equipment. And as we think about the, the Cobra equipment, uh, that end state, is that then, you know, how, how does that enable us to scale to an even larger manufacturing capability? Well, the throughput differences we're seeing on the equipment is really pretty radical so that we can um, generate the same number of parts in a much smaller footprint, as I said, in a, in a faster process, more energy efficiently. So this Cobra, um, as far as we know now, is the end game that we'll be going into production with. I'm sure we'll be continuing to iterate and refine it, but in terms of evolutionary approaches, mm -hmm. uh, this should be the last stage of the, the revolution, and now we'll go into more incremental improvements. So it'll truly be serving as the, the blueprint for the gigawatt hour factory scale. That's right. The Cobra equipment is what we would scale up to run it at, 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 as we plan at the gigawatt hour scale. So Tim, you've been here since the inception of the idea of QuantumScape. It's been, you know, well over 12 years now. How are you feeling about this stage of the company's progress and commercialization efforts? It's incredibly exciting to be working with a commercial launch partner to launch our first product. I think everybody who's worked here throughout the company's history has wanted to bring a product to market so that we can affect, you know, impact the world. Um, when I walk around the building and see a, a bunch of employees really dedicated to the cause and, and executing on the next steps of our plan, that gives me a ton of energy. When I walk around our San Jose campus and see giant buildings getting filled with big pieces of equipment, that, that makes me feel really lucky. Not many people's PhD programs turn into something like that. So uh, everybody knows that solid state is going to be a, a next big evolutionary step in batteries. And it's really exciting to be working on trying to launch those initial products to market. And we'll just be starting on our S-curve. I'm sure there'll be a lot more innovation and, and work to come. Great, thank you, Tim, so much for sharing all of that information. And thank you all for watching this video. Uh, we look forward to sharing more information. A lot of our educational content as well as video content is available on our website as well as our YouTube channel. So please stay tuned for more. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.